Hello and welcome to Mostly Vintage Cameras. This is a Minox presentation box uh, which Minox used to present all of their cameras in. Uh, it's just rather indicative of the premium quality of the Minox brand. Now inside this box we have a Minox touring camera. Now, this is quite an interesting little camera. In 1985 Minox launched a camera called the ML which had program and aperture priority exposure modes and then in 1986 they launched an MB which is exactly the same but it just didn't have program exposure mode so it was a slightly lower priced version uh, now towards the end of the MB production life in 1990 they launched this version which was a limited edition of the MB called the Touring uh, and as we can see from the box the uh, cardboard box this was limited to a production of 3,333 pieces. And my particular one, you can see this, you can either get it with the focus scale calibrated in feet or meters. Uh, my one is in feet. So let's go ahead and take this out of the case and load the battery, because this is an electronic camera after all. It does need a battery. Now on that front, this camera, the ML and the MB, all use a PX28 battery uh, or a PX28L. They're a silver oxide or lithium versions of this. The camera's quite happy with either. Now earlier Minox cameras that tend to have this more triangular shape used a, a mercury cell, a PX27. Now there are modern silver oxide versions of the PX27 but people can be a little bit cautious about using silver oxide slightly different voltage versions of earlier mercury cells but there's no such uh, concerns with the MB I'm going to refer to this largely as the MB rather than the Touring because the MB is exactly the same as the Touring and in fact with the Touring Minox provided the MB instruction book so there's really uh, everything I say about the touring is the same for the MB so to open the lens cover push this button here fold it down and that reveals the battery cover here which I always find a little bit fiddly you have to lift it up and then it kind of comes out there's a simple illustration telling you which way around to put the battery and you just slot it in. The right way around. There we go. Now we're all ready for action. So let's take a look at uh, some of the basic controls of this. I think it might be an idea if I just zoom in a little bit. So we've already seen the lens cover. And let's take a look at the lens. We've got a focus ring here. It's a manual focus camera. There's a little screw head here, and effectively that um, becomes your snapshot mode. So we've got aperture scale here, as I say it's an aperture priority camera, you choose the aperture and the camera chooses the shutter speed. It will display the shutter speed in the viewfinder, uh, and during this video there will be one or two viewfinder camera shots, which are always a little bit shaky but they give an idea of what you can expect as a user experience. So we can see here that if we set this to the 10 to 20 feet mark at f5.6 we're going to get a depth of field of very roughly uh, 8 feet to maybe 30. 8 feet is about 2 and 3 quarter meters, is about 2 and 3 quarter meters. Um, so that's a, a good sort of general purpose snapshot mode to have on there. The shutter release, standard fare. It's a double stroke winding so you have to wind on once and then a second time. And that comes into play with the data back. This is fitted with the D35 data back. Um, I should point out the difference between the Touring and the MB is it can, the Touring comes in this uh, sort of slightly bluey grey colour rather than the more common black 
uh, and the data back, the D35 for the touring is, is colour matched. Mine unfortunately is missing the battery cover, which I've not been able to get a replacement for unfortunately. The battery it uses is a CR2025. But you can print either the date or the time on your photographs. And if you want to do that, you take your photograph and you press the print button and it will then print whichever one you had selected on your picture. Now there is a sneaky way described in the data back instruction book. You can take your picture, hit print for the date for example, wind on once, change the mode to time and hit print again and you'll get the date and the time imprinted on your photographs. It's slightly convoluted but uh, quite fun that you can do that. Also on the top plate we have a standard frame counter, we have a cable release screw in socket, just goes in here. All standard fare. And shutter speeds on this camera, the top shutter speed is 500th of a second. The slowest shutter speed can be as low as 4 seconds. And I say it can be because in a typically uh, eccentric Minox design, the slowest available shutter speed varies with the ISO. So at 25 ISO it can achieve that 4 second long exposure, but at 1600 ISO the longest exposure is limited to a sixteenth of a second. And I'll list all the intermediate settings uh, in the description below. Now the two major selling points of this camera, or these cameras generally, are the fact they are absolutely tiny. If we look at a roll of film, it's sort of hard to imagine how you get a big roll of film like that into such a small camera. So really one of the smallest full frame 35mm cameras ever made. Uh, there's always a little bit of debate between uh, people that like the Rollei 35 cameras, people that like the Minolta TC1 and then the Minox fan club. Uh, as to which was actually genuinely the smallest. Um, to my mind, because this is flat, more like a box of cigarettes or something of that nature, it tends to fit more comfortably in a pocket, like the back pocket of a pair of jeans for example, and therefore it's easier to carry around. And certainly back in the 80s and early 90s when I used to sell these um, in, a, in a camera shop, uh, a lot of people that bought them would refer to them as a visual notebook. So they were already keen photographers and they wanted a, a high quality premium compact camera they could take with them everywhere. And this was before the days of the cameras like the Leica Mini Lux or the Nikon Ti range. So this was really giving photographers a lot of control over depth of field, over focusing, a certain amount over the exposure by using the ISO dial uh, with a premium quality lens and it was the quality of the lens this 35mm 2.8 colour Minotaur lens uh, which was the other big selling point of the camera really super lens on this camera um, as, as good as any to be perfectly honest with you let's carry on looking around our, our uh, touring touring our touring now one of the little quirks of these cameras is the ISO dial is this thing here and quite often as is the case here they just get ruined and they're almost illegible but with the lens flap towards the table we've got 25, 50, 100, 200, 400, 800 and at the top 1600 ISO so if you had a uh, a 400 speed film set, you just push and turn. If you wanted one stop overexposure, there is an overexposure compensation button, but of course we can use the ISO dial as a poor man's exposure compensation dial. So we can have one stop underexposure as well if you wanted to. We just set it up to 800. If you have a, a 35mm Minox and your ISO indicator is, is ruined like this one you can buy a replacement sticker that goes over the top uh, and that will sort of restore it to its former glory with the correct 
text so that you can see it clearly. They're fairly pricey, they're about £20 for the sticker, but they're obviously custom made and fit perfectly. So there's just a few more controls on this thing. This button is a battery condition test. You press this and in the viewfinder a little red light pops up to show the uh, battery is in good order. This slides over and this is the exposure compensation I mentioned earlier. This gives you one stop over exposure. And I did run a roll of film through here and we'll see that that's not always necessary on one of the photographs. And then lastly at the back we have a self timer. Now both the exposure compensation and the self timer are actual switches. You have to remember to turn them off again. Nothing more annoying than using the self timer for one photograph and then you go to take the next picture. Uh, okay, don't know what happened there. Oh no, I've left the self timer on. And we can see we've got an uh, increasingly fast flashing tally light on the front of the camera to warn you that the, the uh, self timer is running. So I won't close that up just yet actually. Oh well. To load the film, that's the film back release lever, and the film back actually detaches to reveal the interior. Film loading on this, you see it's very easy to leave that self timer turned on. Film loading on this uh, is reasonably easy, it's not the easiest ever, but it's by no means complicated, and certainly given the diminutive size of the camera, it's amazing how they've made it as simple as I have. So we stick the film leader on the take-up spool. This film's got a bit curly because it's uh, using so many different cameras. Put that in there. Fire a frame and wind on. Just want to make sure the sprocket's engaged correctly. There we go. Put the film back, back on. You might find you have to jiggle it just a little bit to get it seated correctly. And lock it off. And then what I like to do is just take up the tension in the rewind crank so that when I take the next couple of shots I can see this turn. And that is not loaded correctly. So I'm just going to press the rewind release button, take it back a little bit and we'll have another go. Film loading is absolutely critical to photography. Uh, as I always say, if you don't load the film correctly you're not getting any pictures. And this time around I'm going to do what the instruction book says. Which is put the film cassette in first and then thread the leader. Wow! This is putting up a fight today. Okay, I think we got it this time. Very important, and I think I'm going to leave this in, this fumbling around, just to show that the, uh, it is important to get this right. Now we can see the rewind crank moving around. We don't have that nasty grinding noise as the sprockets were tearing at the uh, little sprocket wheels are tearing at the sprockets. We're all ready to go. Everything's fine. Made a bit of a faff of that. I don't use uh, these cameras very often and they are a little eccentric compared to other film loading. Uh, but don't be put off by that. With a little bit of practice with the dummy film, you'll be absolutely fine. So to rewind the film, we've effectively already seen that. We can press the rewind release button here, and then we just turn the crank 
in the direction of the arrow. And there we go. So that's the basic layout of the controls and how to use it. Um, I think it's worth just taking another quick look at the depth of field scale. So obviously as we increase the aperture, we get more depth of field. So if you were able to shoot at f16, if it was a sunny day, we could set infinity focus to 16 on this side. And everything from four feet, just over a meter, to infinity should be acceptably sharp. Now, of course, if you want to have a margin of error and you're shooting at f16, you could set infinity to f11, and then you're going to get from six feet to infinity acceptably sharp. And of course, this is how uh, these manual focus cameras uh, effectively they're zone focusing, you kind of guess the distance and you rely on the depth of field of the lens, obviously at 2.8 that becomes quite shallow. The only time focus distance becomes critical is at the very near distances, as you see it focuses down to 3 feet or uh, more or less 1 meter, 90 centimeters, somewhere around there. And at this distance, uh, getting the camera the right distance from the subject becomes uh, far more critical and maybe if you are interested in, I don't know, brass rubbing or uh, headstones, where you are going to be working at these nearer distances, maybe keep a bit of string in your pocket that's three foot long, just so you can measure it out. Something like that, some little uh, focusing aid. But otherwise I found whenever I tried to guess the distance uh, with some accuracy, I always seemed to end up just around about that little screw head. So that does seem to be a very convenient snapshot mode. And certainly if you left this at five, six or four with the focus set there, you've got an instantly available snapshot camera. Uh, as I say, it does display the shutter speed in the viewfinder. As you change the aperture, the shutter speed changes, of course. And that's what the viewfinder looks like. So let's go ahead and take a look at some photographs now. The first picture is a street sign and as you can see this really really shows the lens off to a good effect. Uh, great sharpness, lovely colour saturation and it also shows the that a focus aid like a rangefinder isn't always necessary. Guessing the distance has worked perfectly well here because there's just enough depth to feel this is at about three metres. It's also retained some colour in the sky. Quite often when you have a bright sunny day like this, the sky goes a little bit wishy-washy. So the colour rendition, the colour saturation is excellent. There is a little bit of vignetting uh, apparent, uh, but it's not, not too bad in this particular camera. Now comparing that to the next photograph, at the closer distances focusing accuracy does become far more important. We can see the road sign uh, just about in focus, but I was trying to photograph the hubcap, so that didn't really work out. Again, uh, photographing this car in a, in a used car uh, dealership didn't really turn out right. And uh, for me, trying to get one metre set accurately, particularly as I was working at the uh, wider apertures, I'm clearly not quite good enough for that in terms of my ability to uh, estimate distance. So moving on, uh, later in the day, I think this was around about autumn time, uh, sunset over the park. Uh, the vignetting here is a little bit more noticeable, we're shooting into the light and it's very, the sun's very low in the sky. Uh, but nonetheless, even in this very high contrast scene, we are retaining some, some good colour detail uh, and certainly uh, a great deal of sharpness. And that's repeated on the next photograph which is my favourite on this roll of film, which was the park bench. For some reason, this, this photograph uh, appeals to me a great deal. I think these were shot on Portra 160, so you get quite a low contrast film relative to, say, a, a Kodak Gold. So where you are shooting in, in high contrast lighting, it can help uh, mitigate that, let's say. The next picture, this uh, rather vibrant coloured uh, Jeep, uh, or whatever it is, 
Um, and here I was on the other side of the road, and it's one of those occasions when I was trying to gauge the distance accurately. I thought, well, I'm about one meter eighty, almost two meters, and I could probably lay down end to end two and a half times, so that's about five, six meters, somewhere around there. And inevitably, I ended up focusing on that uh, indicated mark where the little screw head is. Sharpness, as you can see, focus is absolutely spot on. Colour saturation is spot on. And again, really shows how good a lens this is. Now here we can see uh, a simple brick wall. Again, colour, sharpness, all good. Focusing may not have been absolutely spot on, but uh, it was near enough to be acceptable. There is I think, I might be imagining it, but there may be just a little bit of barrel distortion apparent in the lens, but it's so slight I don't think it's going to be an issue for, for anyone. Now here's a little trick you can do at the nearer distances if you're photographing something like this uh, sort of decorative stone wall. Uh, if you set it at an angle, then some part of that wall as it, as it goes away from you is going to be in focus. So if you're uh, not quite sure of your focusing distance you can just have the subject go off at an angle. Now this photograph I just happened to like the lighting. I was, I was working at uh, my desk one day and I thought oh that's, that's a nice angle of lighting. I just picked up the MB or the touring and took a little snap. It's not meant to be uh, a fine art picture but uh, it just uh, sort of underlines that idea that these cameras can be a visual notebook for uh, capturing those little moments that uh, crop up from time to time. I went for a walk one day and came across this dovecote and um, here I did use the exposure compensation and in actual fact the exposure would have been fine left to its own devices. I was being a little over cautious with that amount of blue sky in, in, in the subject but even so it still retained the blue in the sky and you know it's if you wanted a, a photograph of a dovecote of a dovecot, I beg your pardon you could do uh, a lot, a lot worse than that. Similar story with the parked car, but good sharpness, good rendition of the colour in the sky and the grass. Now when you get the near focus more or less right, it is actually quite nice. And here we can see a detail of a little stanchion on a wooden bridge, a little river scene up next. Uh, again, don't want to keep banging on about it, but the sharpness in this I think is really outstanding, particularly looking at the sprig of bracken on the right hand side. Now I did go uh, late night shopping, or late-ish night shopping, uh, in my local town centre and there's this little uh, sort of alleyway where there's a few little niche shops, old style sweet shops and a Jamaican kitchen and that sort of thing. But they were all closed at this time of day. So uh, I took a few, uh, a few snaps just by resting the camera on a, a windowsill or a, a wall or a, or a, a dustbin, something of that nature. So we can see here, we use a, a slower a shutter speed, uh, with the self-timer of course. Now in, the, in this next street scene, uh, there's an unusual, it's a sort of a semi-residential, semi-commercial street with an unusual mix of sodium and fluorescent lighting. And it was a really strange kind of a lighting that's uh, appealed to me. So I just, um, again, put the camera, I think I put it on a brick wall and took this little snapshot. Not a particularly remarkable, uh, photograph but it does uh, does record that slightly odd looking artificial lighting uh, again I've now got a note of that should I wish to go back there and photograph it in some other way later and one last point a lot of these photographs I took at night I was resting the camera on some support uh, I did think at one point I could probably get away hand holding but I can assure you when the camera gives you the slow shutter speed warning light which is just to the left of the 30th of a second, it really does mean you should pay attention to the shutter speed because camera shake is very lightly. So anyway, that's been the Minox Touring. As you can probably tell, I quite like this camera. But I like it a great deal. I like all of the small Minox 35 mm cameras. These, as I said earlier, were aimed at photographers people that knew what they were doing, that wanted to control the aperture and the focusing, and they have a premium quality lens or a better quality lens than most compact cameras. For these reasons, whilst they're not in the you know, Mini Lux, uh, Nikon Ti type uh, category, let's say, 
they do fetch premium prices to get an MB, not necessarily a touring, but an MB from a legitimate, respectable retailer with a warranty, with a 14-day money-back guarantee type thing, and a, and a three or six month mechanical warranty. Uh, you're looking at something in the region of £165, which I think, within the context of the way film camera prices are going, I think that's actually very good value. I'm, I'm seeing cameras like a Lomo LCA selling for £100. Uh, Olympus strip prices have, have gone through the through the roof. And when you look at things like like the Mini Lux, uh, the Contax T2, they're selling for twice as much as they did when they were new. So I, I do feel that uh, you know, 165 pounds from a dealer is 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 actually very reasonable. If you go the other way and go onto the private second-hand market, you're likely to pay anything from from sort of 70 to 150, depending on condition where you buy it from, etc. Now the MB is and the ML for that matter, pretty reliable. Some of the earlier cameras. Uh, the CL is the very earliest, in fact this was launched in 1975, it was the first 35mm Minox. Some of the earlier cameras, the electronics could be a little bit flaky, and in actual fact I used to sell the, the PL and the AL. Uh, when people bought them we would say to them, this will go wrong, bring it back to us when it happens, we'll send it to Leica who were the distributor at, the at that time, they will then fix it and after that it will work perfectly reliably. It was a peculiarity of the Minox or the earlier Minox 35mm cameras that that had to happen. But such was the fondness people had for these cameras. When they knew that that was going to happen, they, they accepted it. And when they got the cameras back, they carried on using them for years to come and were very happy. So there we go. That's been the Minox Touring slash MB. Uh, I hope you found this video interesting and of use. Thank you for watching. I do appreciate it. And do have a good day.